The gospel lesson for this Christmas Eve comes from Luke, the second chapter, beginning at the first verse. In those days, a decree went out from Emperor Augustus that all the world should be registered. This was the first registration and was taken while Crinius was governor of Syria. And all went to their own towns to be registered. Joseph also went from the town of Nazareth in Galilee to Judea to the city of David called Bethlehem because he was descended from the house and family of David. He went to be registered with Mary to whom he was engaged and who was expecting a child. And while they were there, the time came for her to deliver her child. And she gave birth to her firstborn son and wrapped him in bands of cloth and laid him in a manger because there was no place for them in the inn. Now in that region there were shepherds living in the fields, keeping watch over their flock by night. And an angel of the Lord stood before them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terrified. But the angel said to them, Do not be afraid, for see, I am bringing you good news of great joy for all the people. To you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, who is the Messiah, the Lord. And this will be a sign for you. You will find the child wrapped in bands of cloth and lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly host praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest heaven and on earth peace among those whom he favors. When the angels had left them and gone into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, Let us go now to Bethlehem and see this thing that has taken place, which the Lord has made known to us. So they went with haste and found Mary and Joseph and the child lying in the manger. And when they saw this, they made known what had been told them about this child. And all who heard it were amazed at what the shepherds told them. But Mary treasured all these words and pondered them in her heart. The shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all they had heard and seen as it had been told them. This is the gospel of our Lord. Thanks be to God. So people of God, grace to you and peace from God our Father, in our Lord Jesus Christ, in his one precious Holy Spirit. Amen. When my great teacher, N.T. Wright, teaches on this passage, he can come across as a little bit eccentric. He starts by sharing how frustrating it can be trying to point something out to a dog. Now, I don't know why anyone would be spending energy and losing sleep trying to spur cognition in a dog, but Bishop Wright is a genius, so let's follow along for a moment. The good bishop says that when you're trying to point something out to a dog, the dog doesn't look at what you're pointing at. Rather, the dog becomes fixated on your finger as it waves around and can see nothing else but your finger. I don't know if that's true. It feels true, but I am not going to spend any time at all testing it. His point is that we, like dogs, steadfastly look at the wrong things at Christmas. Not at the things that the Gospel writers are trying so desperately to show us. So let's test the theory together. You're with a non-Christian friend. And this friend asks you, what is Christmas Eve all about? What do you say? Well, it's a time of joy, of family togetherness, of celebrations and customs and food that span the generations. It's a link to our parents and to our grandparents, and it's a time of joy for our children. It's a time of shopping and preparing and cooking and gift wrapping and decorating. It's, it's a season to remember the poor and the disadvantaged with acts of love and with unity and solidarity. It's loud and it's calm. It's joyful and it's, well, quiet. It's a time to eat too much and to laugh too loud and to forget about exercise and diet entirely. It's a time of family. It's a time to intentionally cultivate memories, a time of making the best of gatherings, even with difficult relatives. It's a season of stress and of peace and of love. And we think to ourselves, that's a pretty good answer. 
And then we think of the challenges of this past year, and we continue. Of course, well, this year is different. We're not supposed to be mixing households. Some of us are going to do it anyway, but it isn't quite as joyful. Most of us are sad and a little bit lonely. Some of us are really sad and really lonely. We're trying to save what we can for the kids. They have lost so much this year, and oddly, there's no snow. And we can't gather at church. That five o'clock family service was so goofy and so loud. Kids everywhere. You couldn't really hear what the pastors were saying, but that was okay. It was great. It was everything church should be. And the 10 o'clock service, well, that was so peaceful. That beautiful little church with the rosemald candle stands in the windows and the darkness and the stillness and the candlelight as we sang Silent Night. It was perfect. Of course, we can't do any of that this year. And we drift off. But then we recover quickly. We shake ourselves right out of our melancholy. We're Swedes and Norwegians mostly, and we're tough. So we continue. This year will have its joys and its memories too. We still have family time, just with our little family units. There'll be less bustle and less craziness. We can Zoom grandma and grandpa. That's what's almost as good as being together. And the outdoor services at Nelsonville will be something to talk about for years. And they'll be short. And the virtual services will be easy to fit into our schedules. No more sitting in church wondering if the turkey is burning at home. It's going to be nice. In spite of everything, a very nice Christmas. And baby, do we ever need a nice Christmas. And you look up and your friend just looks confused. But, okay, but what is the actual holiday about? Oh, sure, sorry. Well, on this day long ago, a little baby was sent by God into the world, and there wasn't any room in the inn, so Mary, that's the baby's mom, had him in a stable, and since she didn't have anything else, she wrapped him in strips of cloth, and she used a manger as a, as a crib, and it was so peaceful and so lovely. The animals were lowing, the poor baby wakes, but little Lord Jesus, no crying he makes. That's a song we sing. Well, that baby grew up to be Jesus. And we smile the smile of the satisfied. No one could give a better answer than that. The only surprise is that our non-Christian friend doesn't convert on the spot. Who wouldn't want to be part of all that? That's the definitive answer for the question, what is Christmas? Right? And if you could see Bishop Wright, he would be smiling a very gentle smile at you. And very gently, he would be waggling a finger. Everything you said was true, all of it, every bit. Yet somehow you focused on everything that was supposed to point you to the transcendent and eternal realities of the day. You focused on the fingers, not the thing being pointed to. Let's get clear. For Luke, Christmas is the day that the King of heaven and earth enters our world and begins his work to reconcile all things under his glorious reign. It's the beginning of the end of every other power. It's the decisive moment when the final revelation of the heart and purpose of the Blessed Trinity commences. It's the moment of turning of hope, the ultimate collapse of darkness. And if you don't see King in your answer at least six times, you have parted company with Luke. So what's it about? Well, there's a king in Rome, a man named Augustus, a self-appointed emperor who crawled onto his throne over the bodies of his adversaries a man who claimed to be Lord of the world and the Son of God, 
a man who wanted the whole world to know his power, so he declared a registration in all of his conquered lands. Everyone had to return to their ancestral homes and be counted. What power that was to make everyone move at his command. What resources to compel and manage such a thing. And what a pawn he is revealed to be. He is a tiny little cog in God's grand plan. By his order, he causes Jesus to be born not in Nazareth, but in Bethlehem. Bethlehem, the city of King David, the city of prophecy, the city from which the Messiah must ultimately come. And so Jesus is born in Bethlehem and wrapped in swaddling cloths and laid in a manger. And the angels are overcome with joy and serenade the earth, celebrating as they say, good news of great joy for all people. To you this day is born in the city of David a Savior, who is the Messiah, the Lord. And they tell the shepherds how to recognize their new king, a child wrapped in swaddling cloths and lying in a manger. Those are not important things in and of themselves, but they're critical as signs, fingers pointing toward what really matters. Look for those signs and behold your king. And in case you haven't caught on yet, the shepherds are called from the fields where they're watching sheep into Bethlehem to be part of the introduction of the new king of Israel. As David was called from the fields where he was watching sheep into Bethlehem to be anointed king of Israel. These are all fingers pointing toward what must be seen, a new king, a new beginning, a new hope. And Mary treasured all these things and pondered them in her heart. And the shepherds returned to their flocks, glorifying and praising God. Merry Christmas, my dear friends. Whatever else Christmas is, whatever celebrations and traditions surround it, whatever we have lost this year, whatever we will gain, whatever our political masters say, however mighty they think themselves, whatever divisions and conflicts assail us, whatever circumstances afflict us, but the celebrations commence. Watch with wonder as God's plan is unveiled. A king has been born to us, the Messiah, the Lord. May that Lord bless you and keep you. May he make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May our good Lord look upon you with favor and grant you peace. In the name of the Father and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.